Thanks very much, and I have no idea how to give a talk after that, <laughs> but I'll try. So this story began with Apple. Um, it began with the Apple FBI case of about 18 months ago, when uh, the FBI asked after the San Bernardino shootings at the health department in which 14 people were killed and a number injured, they asked Apple to open the locked iPhone that they had found and they said that only Apple could open the iPhone and that the iPhone might contain evidence of what, whom the terrorists had communicated with and other information that they would want. Now, it was a little bit odd that they claimed it would contain information about who the terrorists communicated with because they were talking about an 18-minute gap that they couldn't figure out where the terrorist was. But the other point was that, of course, if the terrorist had communicated with anybody during that time, the information would have been at the cell towers. Apple fought the, the case, they fought it on a legal basis, and they also fought it on a security basis. Uh, I got involved because I'd been asked to testify in Congress on the issue. Apple did the legal argument, I'm not a lawyer, I keep reminding people I'm not a lawyer, even though I have written law review pieces and so on, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a lawyer, but I argued the security part. And I argued uh, about the security risks that would ensue. Meanwhile, the FBI was arguing very, very strongly that only Apple could undo the security protections on the phone. And the security protections on the phone included that if somebody punched in an incorrect pin 10 times, then the data on the phone would be destroyed. If, if they punched in an incorrect pin, then the time to type in the next pin would double, all the way up to doubling 10 times, and so it would slow things down. What the FBI wanted was for Apple to send an update to the phone that would undo Apple's security protections. And the FBI claimed that only Apple could get past its own security protections. Well, Apple argued a legal case, it argued a security case, the FBI argued in Congress, it argued in, in the courts, and then the FBI discovered that, lo and behold, somebody else could get into the phone. So the court case went away, but the issue did not. I found myself, after the testimony, being asked to give interviews and talks and so on, and I realized it didn't scale. Uh, I could only travel that much around the world, or even around the United States. And so I spent the last year writing a book, and, and I have flyers outside about the book, but what I'm going to talk to you about is security risks uh, of what the FBI and various law enforcements around the world are asking for, although interestingly enough, not so in Germany. So, in 2010, the FBI began talking about going dark. It said it was having trouble listening to wiretapped communications because people were using encryption. This, of course, is a phone from the dark ages. Um, it may exist in your grandparents' home. It existed in my home growing up. It's a phone that doesn't move, but that does phone calls. Um, <laughs> that's what it's supposed to do, phone calls. Um, the crypto wars are about two different things. The crypto wars in the 1990s were about end-to-end -end encryption. The crypto wars now are about locked devices as well as end-to-end -end encryption. So the first crypto wars were from the 1970s to 2000. And first it was about publication. Could academics and industry people publish about cryptography? In the United States, you may know we have the First Amendment which prohibits the government from controlling publications. You can violate the first, you can violate, you, the government can control things, but if you publish something, if somebody were to publish, if somebody working for the government were to publish a classified document, they could be prosecuted under the uh, violating this, this uh, Secrets Act, but they can't be, you cannot prohibit a newspaper from publishing ahead of time. Um, that one got settled by, by a voluntary arrangement for academics to submit papers about cryptography to the NSA um, before publication. It was a voluntary arrangement. Some people do, some people don't. The NSA asks for some changes sometimes. Um, everything I understand about that is that everything is free and easy. And there's actually a pretty good relationship between NSA and, and the academics on this. 
In the 1980s, the fight was about cryptography standards. As all of you know, the only way anything works on the internet is if you have standards, because otherwise nobody knows how to communicate with anybody else. In the United States, we had the National Bureau of Standards, now known as the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which divided, designed crypto standards for federal communications, federal civilian agencies. Um, that sounds like a pretty narrow thing, but if you're a U.S. company and you're selling to the world at large, 10% of your sales go to the U.S. government, so you pay attention to those standards. And once, the device, once your devices have those standards in there, then other people adopt them. So although it was a standard just for the U.S. government, if it was done right, it could be used widely. In the 1980s, the NSA wanted to take charge of designing those standards. There was a big fight, NIST won. In the 1990s was the real battle, and that was over export controls. And the reason that was a real battle is the US, like Europe, controlled the exports of communications and computers that had cryptography in it. That also had the effect of controlling domestic use because no manufacturer wanted to make two systems, one with weak crypto for export abroad, one with strong crypto for, for use domestically. And so they did one thing that had weak crypto. By the late 1990s, it was problematic because the Defense Department in the United States wanted to buy commercial off-the-shelf equipment. They were required to buy commercial off-the-shelf equipment. They wanted it with strong cryptography. Internet was booming, electronic commerce was booming. Everybody wanted strong cryptography of it enabled in devices. There were also ad hoc and military coalitions that the US and Europe were involved in. And during those ad hoc military coalitions, unlike NATO, you want to be able to share crypto with countries where maybe this year they're on the same side as you, but in three years they might not be. You don't want to share with them the best of your technology. But if you can buy it in commercial off-the-shelf equipment, cool. So in 2000, the U.S. changed its export controls. Europe did it six months earlier. Apparently, Europe did it because uh, it also, it, one of the reasons was that it knew the U.S. was going to do so as well. And so we thought, okay, now it's going to be easy to get good crypto in all sorts of systems. It, in fact, took six, eight, ten years. Since 2000 to, the, to now, the FBI, and not just the FBI, claims it's going dark. In 2010, it said it wasn't able to understand communications because of end-to-end -end cryptography. And everybody here knows what I mean by end-to-end -end cryptography, yes? Good. Um, but since 2015, it's been about locked phones. Um, so in 2016, Director Comey, at the hearing at which I spoke, talked about warrant-proof encryption. He said, if we have a warrant to get into the phone, it shouldn't be warrant-proof. Um, some of, someone I know from the NSA, uh, retired from the NSA, said, well, you know, the law may give us the right to get into a device, but it doesn't mean that it should be easy. Um, but not everybody heard what my friend said from the NSA. The UK has the Investigatory Powers Act. It's meaning about the requirement of the law to require companies to hand over keys, even if they don't have them, is unclear. Um, no surprise, Russia has a package, a, a legal package that says online services must retain the keys. China, the same thing. Australia plans to ban end-to-end -end encryption, and there was this charming interchange where somebody said, well, you can't undo the rules of, rule of mathematics, the laws of mathematics, and the uh, Australian prime minister said, but the, the Australian laws uh, have precedence here. I'll, I'll leave that one alone. Um, um, and then we come to Germany, where I see strong support for civilian control of cryptography. And that is a really impressive bulwark. It's not only impressive because it's a single nation doing, it's a nation doing it, but it also means that applications can be built here and sold elsewhere. And that's a really important aspect of this entire discussion. So before I go into why we need to have strong cryptography and how important it is, I'd actually like to talk a little bit about how you do investigations in the digital age. And I want to go through a couple of them. The first one is an investigation in the second half of the 2000s, a Security and Exchange Commission investigation. Um, the Security and Change Exchange Commission uh, controls things on Wall Street so that there isn't insider trading. And they got a, a tip that the Galleon Group was, in, uh, was involved in insider trading. That is, somebody was 
giving people in the Galleon group information about which companies were going to be merged, which companies were going to be acquired, and so then the people in the Galleon group would purchase stocks ahead of time and make uh, big amounts of money. Um, so the SEC interviewed Raj Ratajaratnam to ask him about a particular person. They had been looking at communications that they were able to get on the basis of this tip. They asked him about a particular person. And what they did when they did so, you know, this is how investigators work. They go on and on for a long time, and then they say, you know, it's getting late. All of us, you know, we should take a bathroom break, maybe get some coffee. Let's, let's take a break. Oh, by the way, have you ever heard of this person, Romy81? because they'd seen an interesting message from that person, Romy81. And he says, oh yeah, that's Romy Khan. So what, what do the SEC people do? Well, the FBI goes and visits Romy Khan, and they show her lots of evidence that she's been illegally sharing information with Rataj Ratnam. And they certainly have enough dope on her to, to put her in jail. And this is, of course, an important way that, that police investigate people, whether it's drug dealers, organized crime, insider training. You flip somebody small, you flip them again, you flip them again, you flip them again. It's part of why locked phones are problematic for state and local police who do a lot of drug investigations that start on the corner and they get a low-level dealer and flip and flip and flip. Well, under legal threat, she did what all of the low-level people do. She cooperated and she taped messages with Rataj Ratnam. And what happens next? By 2011, there are 35 people in jail, including him, and he gets an 11-year sentence. How did it happen? There was an instant message from her that says, do not buy PLCM until I get guidance. It says het guidance, but of course we all know how well it is, easy it is to type on a phone. Um, do not buy PLCM until I get guidance. Clear information um, that she is giving him insider information and he then buys the stock and so on and so forth. What's interesting about this is, think about what would have happened 15 years ago. That would have been a phone call that happened before he was being investigated, before anybody knew about investigating him. Now it's an instant message which stays around. Let me do another one, and this one is a terrorist investigation. You may remember that in 2005 there were four bombs on uh, in three uh, undergrounds and one, uh, one bus in, in London killed a, a large number of people, injured many more. Um, four weeks, two weeks later, there was a similar attempt. But this time, the bombs didn't go off. They created a little bit of smoke in each case and nothing happened. Um, and there were four people that uh, the British police very quickly figured out were the ones who had done it. They had this photo, they found other photos, they started blasting the photos all across the press everywhere they could. What happened? Three of the four were captured through people recognizing them and informing the police. One of them wore a burqa, um, a head-to-toe covering, went to the London bus station and took a bus to Birmingham, wasn't recognized despite the fact that he was six foot something, wearing a burqa, looking, trying to disguise himself as a woman. He was picked up a couple of days later on the streets of Birmingham when he, um, when he wasn't wearing the burqa. Two others were recognized and identified and picked up in the apartment building they were hiding in. The fourth one went down to the south of England, then back up to London, where he was met by his sister and brother-in-law. He got somebody's passport, because they knew who he was. He couldn't travel on his passport. He got a brother or brother-in-law's passport, somebody's phone, and he went to Paris, Milan, Bologna, and Rome, where he was going to stay with a brother in Rome. Except he was using somebody's phone, and the British were tracking him through Paris, Milan, Bologna, Rome, and he was picked up on location information. They, this is 2005. They, uh, cell tower, at that point, the phones are not yet doing GPS. They're doing cell tower recognition. But what they do have is, you know, the cell tower only gives you a region, but they knew where his brother lived, so they went to the brother's apartment, and by goodness, they found him there. So now you think about that and you think about the difference between the way investigations happened 30 years ago where people didn't carry radio antennas that showed where they were at all times. Um, where we didn't have the ubiquity of the, uh, the CCTVs that, uh, that were an early part of this story and we didn't have instant messaging. But I also want to talk to you about cybersecurity or when things go wrong. And the one I want to talk to you about is Sony. So Sony got an email in, just around this time of year, um, two years ago, It said, we've obtained all your internal data, including your secrets and top secrets. If you don't obey us, we'll release data shown below to the world. 
the Sony uh, leadership, the, the corporate leadership, completely ignored the message. It's not clear anybody even read it. They probably thought it was spam. But it wasn't spam. Uh, they released films, email, and HR information. It was pretty embarrassing to Sony. Like everybody, the Sony uh, executives gossiped among each other. They said nasty things about Obama. They said nasty things about other uh, movie stars, about other producers, and so on. It's a good lesson to all of us that if you're going to say something nasty, use a telephone, do it in person. Uh, use an ephemeral communication system. Uh, don't do it in something that stays in email. Uh, it's also a good lesson to all of us that films, you know, uh, films are digital and there was no reason for them to be sitting right on the corporate network, but they were. Uh, why Sony? Sony had produced a movie uh, that mocked the leader of North Korea. North Korea didn't want the film released. Um, North Korea then threatened, or at least the group that was threatening Sony, threatened to bomb the movie theaters if the movie was shown. Uh, Sony said, okay, we're not going to show the movie. At this point, some people pointed out to Sony that it's one thing to electronically attack across the Pacific. It's completely another thing to put bombs in movie theaters. Um, the uh, president, that is President Obama, said this is a national security threat, which at the time seemed to me a bit extreme. But looking back at it now with some hindsight, I think, okay, he's talking about the idea that a nation state is attacking an American entity. And he's objecting to that and he's calling that a nation state. In any case, he, Obama embarrassed Sony into re re releasing the film. I would say he embarrassed them twice because the film was also a dud, but that's a different story. Um, what did Sony do wrong? It did three things wrong. It forgot it was in the digital business. It was making films. It, the executives probably thought of films as these things in big canisters that you, you know, carry around to different movie theaters. No, films are bits. And if you think of films as bits, then you protect them as bits, the same way the financial world knows that money is bits, and you protect the bits. It stored lots of information that it shouldn't have. I told you about, you know, if you're going to say something nasty to somebody, do it in person, do it about somebody else, do it in person, do it on a phone, do it on an encrypted communication uh, where the bits disappear at the end of the communication. And it failed to use good security practices. What do I mean by that? It used to get onto its email, passwords, and it didn't use anything else. So for those of you who went to Richard Clayton's talk earlier today, you know that the pats password like Katze und Hund is pretty bad, but you also know, and, and this is my version of Ich bin ein Berliner, uh, but as, as Richard pointed out, everybody substitutes uh, a, a one or an exclamation part mark for an I and uh, an eight for an E and so on, and, and that doesn't work real well either. What it didn't do was do two-factor authentication. It didn't do it then, it does it now. So what I want to do now is separate a little bit the issues for you about encryption, because they're really two different kinds. There's encryption talking about the phone, about the communication, and encryption about the locked phones. And I want to start with end-to-end -end encryption. So does everybody here know what forward secrecy is, or should I briefly explain? I need a response. Explain. So um, if you use the same encryption key for a series of communications, then if, if your adversary has been collecting your communications over time, and certain adversaries do that, uh, for example, the United States during the Second World War collected, Germ uh, collected Russian communications over a long period. They, does everybody know what a one-time pad is? It's a, a key that's just very, very long, that you, is the length of the message, and you use it once um, to encrypt the communication. So it's a string of one and zeros with your communication, which is also ones and zeros. You add it together. Then to decrypt, you add the key back in, and it cancels itself. Everybody with me on one-time pad? At least as much as you need to be? Well, the, the Russians were using one-time pads during the Second World War, but it was hard to get to their various embassies. They reused the one-time pads. In the, in the mid-50s, the US figured out that they had done so. Um, broke some of the messages. That was part of how the Burgess McLean Philby uh, group was exposed at that time. Um, what you do to protect against when your adversary collects your messages is if you use a different key for each communication. We call that forward secrecy. That means that the, the adversary, if he finds your key, will be able to to break your system moving forward, but he can't get any of your back stuff because the keys have been calculated previously and they're, they're gone. 
So if you want to break end-to-end -end encryption, if you want what the, the FBI calls exceptional access, access to a communication even though it's end-to-end -end encrypted, you break forward secrecy. Everybody with me on that? Good. And this, by the way, is discussed in a paper that I've done with, uh, I guess, 14 other people called Keys Under Doormats. We also observed it breaks authenticated encryption. What's authenticated encryption? Well, when you're communicating over an electronic channel, it's pretty hard to authenticate the other guy. You really want to know it's the other person and not somebody stepping in in the middle. So you, you do a, a crypto communication that does authentication for you. And then you do another crypto communication that, that encrypts the communi communication end to end. What we know from many years of doing cryptography is that the mathematics in cryptography very rarely breaks. The protocols break sometimes and the implementations break all the time. Okay? If you want to look at where things are going to break, vote for the implementation. That's where the problems are. So, authenticated encryption is a way of getting around that problem by having fewer protocols and fewer implementations use the same key for authentication and encryption. But, if the FBI says we want exceptional access, if law enforcement says they want exceptional access, then what they want is they want to be able to break the confidentiality, but they don't care about breaking the authentication. What that means is that the authentication becomes separated from the encryption. You're back to two different systems. Every software engineer, every software engineer knows that complexity is the enemy of, of security. There's also the problem that weak cryptographic algorithms last decades, and that undermines security for the long term. I showed you that picture of that black phone. I'm sure some of you use your smartphones to call those phones. They have to be at your grandparents' house or your great aunt's house. And why does it work? Because in communications, we prize backwards compatibility. Somebody has a browser from the 1990s, that browser can access the Google web page. It can't see all the dancing pigs or whatever else Google might put on the page, but it can, it can access the web page because we believe in backwards compatibility. In the 1990s, we had a rule about short crypto, small key crypto, because that was the requirement or under export controls. Two years ago, in what's called the freak attack, um, the, uh, the researchers found a way to get the browser and the server to roll back the crypto. Both sys ends had to have systems that supported 40-bit crypto. So they rolled back the, the protocol so that both of them agreed they were doing 40-bit crypto, which is, of course, easy to break. You put in a weak system, a weak end-to-end -end encryption system now to satisfy the requirements of law enforcement, and then you decide after five years, hey, that lets the bad guys break in too much, we don't want to do it. You've undermined not just the last five years of when you had it, but going forward another 20 because of backwards compatibility. And then finally, there's the question of who holds the keys. If the US wants access to end-to-end -to -end encrypted communications, somewhere in the US has to hold the keys. Does that mean when I bring my phone across the border, um, I then have to get a new phone in order for the German government or the UK government or the Canadian government? Or is there a fast way that if, if police in this country or a different country want to get at the keys, um, they communicate with police over there? It doesn't work in a fast way because in the US, for example, we have the death penalty and a lot of Europe will not extradite criminals to the US if they face the, the death penalty. They're, those arrangements don't happen overnight when you agree to share evidence and so on. They take a while because of differing laws. So the problem of who holds the keys is serious. Back in the 1990s, uh, the US government proposed the clipper chip. Some of you are old enough to remember it. It was an 80-bit encryption system in which two agencies of the US government would hold the keys. Um, it wasn't popular in the US. Uh, AT&T implemented it on a secure phone device. They thought they'd sell it around malls in America. When I checked in 1997, they had sold 15,000 secure phones, and half of those went to the FBI. That's not selling in malls of America. And you can imagine that if it didn't sell domestically, it really didn't sell abroad, because who wants keys abroad stored with agencies of the US government? So that was the sign that went around, Sync Clipper, um, designed by RSA, the company. There's a different issue about phones. And so once, one thing you have to do is think very hard about how we use phones. Phones, of course, we use to communicate, we use to store data, and we do lots of other things with them. 
Um, why would we lock phones? Well, there's theft of phones and there's theft of data. So when smartphones first happened, uh, the theft of phones was really rampant. If you think about it in cities, it was really easy to jostle somebody, grab their phone, and run away. And you're talking about a $600 device. Pretty, pretty little effort to get a $600 device. So Apple put on an activation lock and find my iPhone, and thefts really dropped. Theft of data was a different story. So Apple found in the late 2000s that there was a group in China that figured out a way to take the data off of lost, misplaced, stolen phones. And this, this group had figured out a hack that would get data off the phones, get email off the phones, and then they would use that to do identity fraud. Um, you know, send a mail saying, hi, I'm stuck in Barcelona, uh, somebody grabbed my wallet uh, I don't have, and my passport, I don't have any identification, grandpa, can you please send me $5,000 or $500 so I can get home? Um, what Apple did is they began protecting email through encryption. They in figured a way in 2011 how to entangle the key, the device key with a pin so that thieves couldn't get the, the data. And this Chinese group was not only doing the hack in a box in China, but they were selling this tool abroad. Okay, so the, the problem was not just in China with stolen phones in China, but everywhere. Apple's response was, we're going to protect the data on the phone. So they first did it for email, and then they expanded that protection uh, to other data on the phone. Well, why, why should you lock phones? So um, there was a very good talk at... Um, Enigma conference two years ago about the most effective way to break into systems. The most effective way to break into systems is to get the login information of a sysadmin or somebody with lots of network privileges. That's what you do. Um, especially if the network privileges they have come through a password and a user account and that's it. So the best way to stop that is to have a second factor. Now some people will carry USB keys and so on, but many people won't. Everybody carries a phone. And so using a phone as second factor is a really good way to protect uh, yourself and your accounts. Sometimes. SMS was the original preferred way to use second factor authentication. You want to get onto some protected account, uh, you get an SMS sent from the account, like maybe your Gmail account, to your phone, and then um, you type in the, the code that you get on your phone and, and you're in. Except it turns out that if you are an important character, like the Black Lives Matter activist DeRay McKeeson, then maybe you'll be the target of an attack. So all of a sudden somebody is sending stuff out of his Twitter account, but it's not him. What happened? A little bit of social engineering. Hi to the phone company. Um, my girlfriend smashed my phone when she was mad at me. I lost my phone when we had a car accident. Whatever it is, I have a new phone number for the account. Could you please send the SMS over here instead? Very effective social engineering. And he doesn't know what happens till all of a sudden he starts getting messages saying, why are you, why are you sending out these Twitter messages? Damage is, is done. I mean, you can undo it, but the damage is already done. Better way to do it is to have a, a program on your machine on your, on your phone, Duo Google Authenticator. So you're not getting an SMS to your phone. You have to have the phone with you because the phone itself calculates the second factor. So Duo is a small company in Michigan that is producing extremely usable uh, second factor authenticators for large universities, large pieces of industry, but where they really aimed for was the small users. What they told me was the hair salon owners and the garage mechanics. Um, because they wanted a system that was usable. Uh, when you build a usable system, lots of people come. Google Authenticator is a different version. So why does that argue for locking phones? Well, I don't have to tell you that if you make it easy to break into the phone, you make it easy to mess up the second factor authenticator on the phone as well. You weaken both of those. You weaken the data, data protection, but you also weaken the protection of, of programs on the phone. Let me give you one other history lesson. In the 1990s, the U.S. passed the Communications Assist Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, which required that all digital telephone networks be built wiretap enabled. Wiretap enabled um, meant that you had to have wiretapping capability built into the switch. 
The FBI had been very nervous about things like call forwarding. They used to be able to tap at what was called the phone frame and the phone central office very close to the phone number. But with things like call forwarding, where the call doesn't go through the frame into the phone but gets turned around at the switch, they couldn't do it. So they wanted wiretapping capability and built into the switch. Think about that for a moment. You're building wiretapping capability into infrastructure. What happens? Um, well, I talked to people from the NSA, and in the mid-2000s, because NSA is responsible for evaluating the security of all switches and routers and communications devices sold to the military that examined switches and, and devices that were what we call CALEA compliant, they found security problems in all of them. They hadn't examined all switches and, and routers, only the ones that were being, uh, that the DOD, the Department of Defense was thinking of buying. They found security problems in every single one of them in the CALEA compliant part. Pretty amazing. The other part is the, the story of Greek telecom. Some of you may know that 2004, 2005, for a period of 10 months, senior officials in the Greek government, the prime minister, the head of the Ministry of Interior, head of the Ministry of Defense, head of, De of, Defense, head of the uh, opposition party, were wiretapped. 100 senior people. Um, that was the, Europe had a similar requirement to Kalia. What happened, Greek telecom had bought uh, a phone switch from Ericsson. Uh, they didn't want wiretapping capability, they didn't pay for it. Switch got updated, wiretapping capability was put in, not turned on because the Greeks hadn't paid for it. Um, in addition, there wasn't auditing capability because the Greeks hadn't paid for the wiretapping capability. Somebody turned on the wiretapping, no auditing because it wasn't part of the software, and for 10 months there was wiretapping. Um, it was discovered when an SMS went awry. Now, I've just told you how it was done. I haven't told you who did it because we officially still don't know who did it. There's suspicions, but what's the point? You build capability in for wiretapping. You make it easy to break into systems. It will happen. So, how would police investigate if we had locked phones and if we had end-to-end uh, -end encryption? Well, as I pointed out already, there's cameras, there's communications metadata, there's cloud data. If you think about Facebook, if you think about LinkedIn, if you think about Google, if you think about the thousands of cloud providers, what they do is provide value by working on the data you give them. And so while they will store it encrypted, they use it in the clear. And if law enforcement comes to them with a, a warrant to get at the data, they often usually have it in the clear or are able to get it in the clear. And of course, there's the Internet of Things. I don't know about cases in, in Europe, but I know there are cases already in the US where the Internet of Things, the Fitbit on the wife's wrist that shows she walked around the house a whole bunch before she was killed, as opposed to the husband's story that he came back from some event and there she was lying dead. No, that wasn't true. Um, the, the other pieces of Internet of Things who provide, that provide evidence for law enforcement. So, for example, you, you might have communications metadata, which is what enabled investigators to discover who had killed Harari, the ex-prime ex minister in Lebanon who was killed by a truck bomb, studying the patterns of cell phones in Beirut the day he was killed, and for several months before, they uncovered a large conspiracy just looking at cell phone patterns. They could see who did it, and then because they hadn't done quite the right tradecraft, they were also able to see um, who, in fact, some of those people were. Um, on the right, uh, your right, uh, your, yeah, your right, uh, there's an automated license plate reader. Palantir, the company in Silicon Valley, told me about an instance where police had a, a, cert, had a warrant to be able to follow data. They were following the cell phone of a particular person particular bad guy. The automated license plate readers told them where the, the bad guy was going. They were following the car to start with. That told them which cell towers to look at. They discovered that the cell towers, there was a phone number paired. There were two phone numbers. This is data that people didn't have, investigators didn't have 15 years ago. The cell towers uncovered for them a second bad guy in the car. They were following a bad guy without leaving their office. And then, of course, there's hacking software. And the FBI has been using hacking software for over a decade, as I'm sure law enforcement in, in Europe has as well. So having told you all of that, I have to tell you why encourage cryptography's use. And for that, I want to talk about civil society. Um, at the time that the U.S. government, the defense agency, said that yes, there had been Russian uh, hacking efforts 
in the recent campaign um, and confirmed that in January 2017, one of the important things that the government, that the intelligence agency said is we assess Russian intelligence services collected against US primary campaigns, all of you knew that, think tanks and lobbying groups they viewed as likely to shape future US policies. You guys probably don't think about civil society much, um, but it's something that is the absolute glue in democracies, a healthy civic society, the group of organizations that sit between the people and the government. I know the names in the United States, I don't have the right names here um, or in the UK, but they're the Sierra Clubs that work on the environment. They're the professional organizations like the American Bar Association or the American uh, Medical Association that produce reports about how doctors should be certified or, uh, or whether uh, cigarette smoke causes cancer. Um, there are all sorts of organizations like that. They are very important for transmitting information from the people to the government about what the people want and from the government to the people about what the government is doing. They're the activists who pay attention to very complicated things going on. Healthy democracies have them. Countries that are teetering towards autocratic societies don't. And in particular, uh, interesting tidbit is that when the, the Soviets took over in the Soviet Union in, the, in, in 1917, one of the first things they did was eliminate civil society organizations. The same thing happened in East Germany, uh, Czechoslovakia, Poland at the end of the Second World War. First, they, they eliminated opposition political opposition through assassination, but they also went after civil society organizations. You know, one example to think about is the role of the Catholic Church in Poland um, and in the overturn of, of, of Soviet domination in Poland. The Catholic Church was really important there um, and something that the Soviet Union had always been very nervous about. So let me tell you about two civic society issues. One of them is climate gate. Now you may think that in the United States we don't believe in climate change. We used to. I don't know why we don't so much anymore because of course it's actually more apparent now. But in 2008, 71% of Americans believed in climate change. And the House, which is one of our two legislative bodies in, in the federal government, passed a major bill on climate change in anticipation of a meeting in Copenhagen. The bill was supposed to go up in the Senate, but what happened next was ClimateGate, in which uh, mail from the University of East Anglia was stolen, climate study group in the University of East Anglia was stolen. Remember I told you about the sort of jokey way we write an email? So there was, should I present the material this way? Should I tweak the data that way? You all know we do this all the time. We say it, we talk informally. We say things informally that if we were giving a presentation to a customer, to a boss, we'd be much more careful because the much more careful is actually accurate, but we're sort of fooling around. We're, we're talking informally. Well, the mails got published, selectively pointed to, and within two years, the belief in climate change dropped in the United States. And the trust in scientists dropped. And you know what, what's going on in the United States now in terms of how much support there is for doing things to, to, to stop climate change, to counter climate change. Another example, uh, there's a terrific organization in Toronto called Citizen Lab. It's part of the University of Toronto. They study attacks on human rights groups and on journalists. Um, and one of the studies they did recently was one called Tainted Leaks. They looked at the American journalist David Satter, who had prepared a report on Radio Liberty's investigative reporting. And it was investigative reporting about situations in Russia. Radio Liberty is a US government funded organization. Satter was working for the US government. He was writing a report on Radio Liberty's US government funded investigative reporting. What happens next is he is the report gets stolen and doctored versions of the report that make it appear that Russian anti-corruption activists are being funded by the US government. So I have a small example from the Tainted Leaks report. The original report says Radio Liberty, Russian, the Radio Liberty Russian investigative project is gaining traction, blah, blah, blah. It changes it to the Russian investigative reporting project is gaining traction. If you're trying to undermine the the position of Russian anti-corruption activists. If you're trying to undermine the position of Russian anti-corruption activists, one of the best ways to do it is to act as if they're being funded by the Americans, which they're not. So you take a report like this, you, you change it, and you publish it. And it got published on, on various sites known to belong to, to Russian entities. 
So that's what happens. So um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the role of civil society, and I have a whole bunch of different ones. The National Academy of Sciences, which is the U.S. Uh, National Academy of Sciences, prepares reports. It might be reports like the one I'm on about what alternatives or how you would judge alternatives for law enforcement to get plain text if encryption is widely available. It might be on how forensic investigations are conducted or how whether the study of uh, the use of DNA in court cases is adequately scientifically based. Um, all sorts of reports. Some can be on controversial issues, some on less controversial issues, how you do STEM education, science, technology, uh, I don't remember what E is for, engineering and mathematics education, all sorts of reports. What happens if you taint the emails of those scientists or you taint the data in these reports? The National Academy of Sciences uses senior scientists and engineers and social scientists from around the country to produce their reports. Their reports are really influential in Washington. They affect how bills are written. They affect how law is because they're seen as a unbiased view of reality a trusted view of reality. But if you taint the reports, if you go in and affect the report, a number that it's supposed to be 1.3 gets changed to 1.8 just before it's published. How many times do you have to do it before the National Academy of Sciences reports aren't trusted? Or the American Cancer S uh, Society? Or if you think about stuff at the local level, every locality has arguments about whether an immigrant housing a uh, place should be built over here, whether money should go towards kindergartens or, or the housing for the elderly, all sorts of debates. Civil society is what knits groups together. But if you start creating division in civil society, you really hurt democracy. So whether it's the Sierra Club, which fights for uh, conservation, or the Southern Poverty Law Center, which exposes hate speech, hate crime, or Planned Parenthood, or Greenpeace. Some of you are old enough to remember the French attacks on Greenpeace um, about whaling. So if the French government can go after Greenpeace, what if another nation state does? So if I think for a moment about civil society, what does civil society need? If we go back to when cyber attacks first happened, they happened in the 1980s over military sites. That's when the U.S. discovered that the Russians were snooping in. Now, we know less about what the, where the U.S. was snooping, but we do know that the Russians were snooping on U.S. military sites. Actually, the person who was doing it came from, from Germany um, and was tracked to Germany at the time. It was a German tracked in, to Germany. In the 1990s, we found uh, similar uh, attacks, and I say attacks, they're really cyber espionage on government sites. By the 2000s, of course, it was major espionage on industry. Now we're talking about threats to civil society. It's hard enough for governments to protect themselves, it's hard for industry to protect themselves. Civil society are small organizations largely, threadbare budgets, no good forms of protection. What they need to rely on is ubiquitous security. Ubiquitous security supplied through things like end-to-end -end encryption and apps like Signal and WhatsApp and, and so on. And locked devices that secure, that both enable phones to continue to act as second factor, but also protect the data. So in a nutshell, the going dark is not a, a debate is not about security versus privacy. Law enforcement in the United States and sometimes in, in the UK and other places talk about in security and privacy we have to protect, uh, you know, you don't have any privacy if your nation isn't secure, et cetera, et cetera. This is really a debate about law enforcement investigations versus personal business and national security. That is to say we're in a situation where much of our values, much of what we value, much of, much of our strength comes from the data that we keep on digital devices of various sorts and we need to protect and secure them. It's about securing those devices versus making law enforcement investigations more, uh, more simple to do. And so it's really a debate about security versus security. And when I phrase it as a debate about security versus security, then you can take a step back and think about what law enforcement might need. Law enforcement has had, for the last 15 years, the ability to investigate phones easily, the ability to listen to communications easily, because encryption wasn't ubiquitous. When they had that ability, we probably didn't fund law enforcement quite the right way. 
We also didn't educate law enforcement about how to do investigations in the digital age. So one of the things I discovered during the process of writing this book was in the late 1990s, the, FBI, the NSA was going deaf. Now that may be hard for you to believe because of course you've all seen the Snowden disclosures. But between the variety of different kinds of communications, which were not only fax and email and phone, but all sorts of the new applications that were becoming available because of the web, um, the volume of communications, because all of a sudden we had a different way of communicating, you no longer had to call somebody in order to reach them, but you could send them many more communications in many different ways. Volume, variety, and uh, uh, the speed, which is also a V word that I'm forgetting. Uh, somebody in the audience can remember it for me. But that, that set of three things, by the end of the 1990s, the NSA was not doing its job very well. And there was a lot of concern about whether or not it could listen in. Well, one of the things we learned in the Snowden disclosures is just how effective the NSA had become. I know there's a new issue about its tools being stolen. But, but talking about its capabilities, extraordinarily high. The NSA retooled between the late 1990s and the mid-2010s mid to the point that even though it faced encryption, a former NSA director could say its signals intelligence capabilities was better than ever. The FBI didn't do a similar retooling. It didn't say, oh, the communications world is changing, data world is changing, how do we do investigations in this new world? And that's the thing that really has to happen in this debate about security versus security. So with that, I'll thank you, and uh, remember to rate this session. Thank you very much. Are there any advantages of a hard token device versus soft token apps for two-factor authentication? Sure. I mean, hard token is harder to mess up on. And, and if the FBI gets its way about, about making device uh, software, uh, about making phones easier to unlock. On the other hand, when you have a phone, you always know where it is. And uh, when I worked for Sun, I had a hardware token. I came back from a trip from Europe, and the next day I couldn't find my hardware token anywhere. And I looked all over, I couldn't find it. And then I thought maybe I'd left it in Brussels, and then I realized, no, I'd logged on once, and I couldn't log on without the hardware token. And that's when I realized one of my kids had hidden it. And once I knew one of my kids had hidden it, I knew where to look. But, you know, when you think you've misplaced something, you look between the cushions on, on the sofa. You don't take the cushions off the sofa to see if it's actually underneath the cushion, because that wouldn't happen. So, uh, so the point is that convenience, of course, is the phone. Hardware token is probably slightly better, but it's probably not worth it for most people. You mentioned that Germany is big on private encryption. Are there any other countries with similar stance? Nobody who's as important economically and who's as strong technically. Nobody else is in the same league. Okay. Do you think there's a limit to protecting data from law enforcement? So it's not about whether there's a limit to protecting data from law enforcement. You can't have a robust, for example, stock market if financial companies were able to hide their information. You have to, in fact, be able to investigate. So, in fact, stockbrokers and other financial institutions are required to record their communications. Anytime you call somebody in an institution like that, immediately you hear, this call is being recorded. And you want that transparency. You want the transparency that banks are required to have, that they have to excuse me, have to report any uh, transaction of over $10,000. There are various organizations that have to have transparency. Um, I assume that drug companies dealing in opioids have to have a certain level of transparency about who they're selling to and how long they have to keep the records and so on. So it's not about preventing law enforcement from ever getting any information. It's really about the issue of uh, enabling a certain level of protection within society versus making law enforcement investigations more efficient. Thank you. Uh, what advice do you have for women who want to work in cybersecurity? Uh, be tough. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I think that's true for women in computer science or technical fields regardless. Um, be tough. I think it's really useful, and this is not true just for women, I think it's really useful to think broadly as well as deeply. It's important to be an expert in a particular area. But keeping abreast of things across, including usability, including uh, where government policy is heading. Sometimes you want to make a change in a, your career, but not make a huge jump, make a small jump, and, and having that breath is useful. But having that breath is also useful when you're 
having conversations uh, with people at work. So f when, I, when I was teaching at Worcester Polytech, which I did until this year, I moved to Tufts now, um, and so I haven't yet taught at Tufts, but I will say the thing, same thing to my Tufts students. I told them that when I was at Sun, uh, I found speaking several languages was really important, and I didn't mean Mandarin, which I don't speak, or Spanish, or, f or an English. I really meant being able to talk to lawyers and business people and computer scientists, but having that breadth of being able to understand the other person in another field was really valuable, and of course that's true for men and women. Thank you. Do you think leaks such as WikiLeaks or Snowden help or actually hurt countries? So the Snowden one is a, a, a nuanced one. Um, Snowden released lots of documents. Some of those documents, like the one that talked about bulk collection of, of communications metadata, bulk, domestic bulk collection of communications metadata, was a secret interpretation of the USA Patriot Act. Uh, I don't think a democracy can ever have a secret interpretation of a law that's completely antithetical to a democracy. Democracies work by open laws, and that includes no secret interpretations of the law. Secret interpretation of the law is like a secret law. So that was extremely useful, and in fact, we had a change in law as a result of that. The other thing we discovered from Snowden is that um, uh, NIST was in charge, and is in charge, of developing cryptographic standards for use by the federal government. NSA got NIST to recommend an algorithm, dual ECDRBG, that was a random number generator, that it strongly appears that NSA had a backdoor into so that it could predict how the random numbers were generated. And the random numbers were, of course, used for a crypto algorithm. Once you can predict the random numbers of a key, you can predict a whole lot, can't you? Or you can find out a whole lot. What that did is it tainted NIST's reputation as a purveyor of crypto standards. NIST had been extremely widely respected over the previous 15, 18 years for the way it handled the advanced encryption standard competition, which was open to the world, and the algorithm was actually picked by, uh, the algorithm picked was designed by two Belgians. It was respected for other competitions that it was running in crypto standards. That was a really serious harm. Others of the pieces of information that Snowden released, I think were less important to release. On the other hand, what he did is he largely released, I don't want to say metadata, but information about things that NSA was doing, but not actual sources and methods. WikiLeaks is publishing all sorts of information it has no business doing. Uh, if you think back to what it did in, uh, in Afghanistan, publishing the film that showed drone pilots targeting civilians was an important thing. That was a pretty horrible thing that was happening. It's important to show it. But publishing information about uh, informers in Afghanistan or Iraq, putting peop those people at risk, I think WikiLeaks is, is, incre is incredibly damaging to democracies, um, is, is a very twisted and warped sense of, of what's healthy. And so I, I, don't, I don't have the respect for WikiLeaks. I, you know, I have mixed feelings about Snowden. I think he did some important things. I also think there was probably too much release. All right, one last question. Windows, Linux, or Mac? <laughs> <laughs> so when I started at Sun, I joined a group that was doing Linux. This was 1999. My PhD is in theoretical computer science. Uh, I do know how to, you know, I can look at a piece of mathematics and tell you this is a reasonable piece of mathematics. System administration is not my strong point. Uh, so using Linux in 1999 was awful. Um, <laughs> God awful. And I, I was agree. really relieved when finally my group said, okay, go ahead and get a Mac, because every time we updated our VPN, it was somewhere between two and 14 hours for me to update the VPN on the Linux box. Linux was not well supported in those days. Um, I like Macs. I find them usable and, and, and much better to use than, uh, than Windows. Windows has really improved its security story in the last dozen years. Uh, Microsoft has a much better security story than it did. And I think it's actually a, a reasonable security story. But uh, I think I can go on record as hating Word, which I have to use every time I write a law review paper. I have two co-authors, and it's a race which one of us says, I hate Word the earliest in, in writing a paper. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your keynote. Thank you. Thank you.